So far in these sessions, we've talked about valuing primarily public companies, whether it's discounted cash flow valuation or relative valuation. But what if your task is to value a private business, a small private business or even a large private business? You're saying, what's different about valuing a private business? There are two aspects to a private business that I think make valuation a little more difficult. The first is there's no market value for the company right now. You're saying, so what? Take a look at the discounted cash flow valuations you did of public companies and think of how much you use market values along the way. Use market values of equity and debt to get your cost of capital. Use market values of debt and equity to get a levered beta. And when you were done with your valuation, you actually compared the value that you got to the market value to see if you're within shouting distance of where you should be. I'm gonna take that market value away from you in a private business. The second difference is that accounting statements might be difficult with public companies. There might be mild differences across companies, but at least they follow a common standard. With private businesses, especially small private businesses, the differences in accounting standards tend to be much larger. What does that mean? When you're buying a private business, it's buyer beware. You cannot take the financial statements as is. And there are two issues, at least, that you will have to deal with. One is the owner might not charge himself or herself a salary. The line between salary and dividends is a fine one. The second, private businesses, there's an intermingling of personal and business expenses that might make the numbers a little deceptive. Here's the other thing to remember about private businesses. If you're ever asked to value private business, the first question you need to ask is why? Motive matters. Because the value attached to a private business can depend very much on who the potential buyer is. In fact, I'm gonna divide this discussion into four types of transactions. You can have a private to private transaction where one individual sells his business to another individual. It can be a private to public transaction where you sell your business to a publicly traded company. It can be a private to IPO, where you're taking a private business public, not an option for most private businesses, but if you have one, you might take it. And the final scenario I'd like to talk about is a private company that sells a stake in itself to a venture capitalist. Let's start with what I think is the most difficult of these scenarios, a private to private transaction. In a private to private transaction, there are three big issues you've got to deal with along the way. The first is your potential buyer in this case, because it's another individual, is unlikely to be diversified. You're saying, so what? Almost everything we did in coming up with cost of equity and cost of capital for publicly traded companies was based on the assumption that the marginal investor was diversified. An assumption you can get away with with most publicly traded companies, but with a small private business being bought by another individual, that's an assumption that's not gonna stand up to scrutiny. Second, in private businesses, you have to worry about what I call the key person. The founder or the owner of the private business might account for a big chunk of the value that you see in the business. If you're buying the business from that person, you've got to ask yourself the question. If that person leaves, what will happen to this business? In most cases, that's going to lead to a discount in the value. And third and final issue you have to deal with, and it's an issue we dealt with in, in part when we talked about public companies, is the illiquidity that comes about when you buy an entire business. Unlike buying a thousand shares in a public company, we can change your mind and sell the shares back. If you buy a private business, it's much more difficult to get rid of the business if you don't want it anymore. That leads to an illiquidity discount. So let's start with the first issue. How do you deal with the fact that investors in private businesses, especially if they're individuals buying the business, are unlikely to be diversified? Let's use a very simple example to bring home this process. Let's assume you have a business with 100 units of risk. Let's assume that 20 of those units are market risk, macroeconomic risk, risk you cannot diversify away. When you use a conventional beta, you're measuring the risk in those 20 units. If you're buying this business and you're not going to be diversified, you're gonna be exposed not just to those 20 units of risk, you're gonna be exposed to all 100 units of risk. Algebraically, you're going to be exposed to five times as much risk as a diversified investor investing in this company. I'm going to use that insight to estimate what I call a total beta. And here's my measure of a total beta. A market beta measures your exposure to market risk. That's what we get when we run that regression, we use the slope, or all the approaches we use for public companies, we were talking about market betas. A total beta measures your exposure to total risk. You might wonder, how am I going to go from market beta to total beta? Let me take a very simple example. Let's assume 
you're valuing a privately owned retailer, a high-end retailer. To get a beta for the company, here's what I did. I went and looked at publicly traded high-end retailers. The beta that I got for those companies on an unlevered basis was 1.18. That would be the beta I would have used to value a publicly traded high-end retailer. But you're a buyer of a private business where you cannot diversify away the risk. So here's the other statistic I looked up. When you run a regression to get the beta, you also get a sense of how much of the risk in a company comes in the market. It's the R squared of the regression. In fact, if you take the square root of the R squared, you get the correlation of this company with the market. On average, the correlation of high-end retailers with the market is about 50%. I keep track of that number. If I divide the unlevered beta 1.18 by 0.5, I come up with a total unlevered beta. You saying, what are you doing? I'm essentially assuming that you're exposed not just to the 50%, which is market risk, but to the remaining 50% that is firm specific. In estimating the cost of equity for your company as a private business, in a private transaction, I'm gonna use the total beta, and here is a final adjustment I need to make. With public companies, the debt to equity ratio and debt to capital ratios are used to come up with the cost of equity and cost of capital, tend to be market values. The private business, I don't have those numbers. Here's a simple way around it. I use the industry average debt to equity ratio for, 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 for publicly traded high-end retailers. I'm in a sense assuming that this private business has to operate by that same ratio. That ratio is 14.33%, plugging that in, I get a total beta for the company and a total cost of equity. That total cost of equity, 14.5%, is significantly higher than the cost of equity I'd have estimated for a public company. I use that same measure as my debt ratio to come up with the cost of capital for a private business. So in a private to private transaction, assuming that the buyer is completely undiversified, one solution to the lack of diversification problem is to adjust the beta, use the total beta, and use the cost of equity and cost of capital that emerges from that total beta. That'll give you a value for the private business. Now let's ask the question about what to do about the fact that the owner might be a key person. That in, put differently, if you bought this business from the owner and the owner left, that you might lose some revenue, some customers might leave you. Use, a common, use your common sense to make the best judgment you can. Ask yourself this question. If I bought this business and the owner slash founder were no longer there, how much of my revenues drop? How much of my operating income drop? Value the business using that lower operating income. Then use it as a bargaining chip. In what sense? Go to the owner founder and offer that amount as a value. He or she is probably going to be disappointed that the number is so low. Tell him or her why you're paying a low value. Maybe you can negotiate a way where the owner or founder stays on for a few years and arranges a transition where you don't have as big a drop in operating income. That's done in many businesses. So that's a key person issue. You have to deal with it in the operating income. Which brings us to the third and final issue, is the, which is the issue of illiquidity. As we mentioned in an earlier session, illiquidity is a continuum. All investments are illiquid. The question is by how much. Private businesses are particularly illiquid. So what you often have to do as a potential buyer of a private business is factor in that illiquidity into your valuation right off from the start. And as again, with public companies, there are two ways you can adjust for liquidity. One is you can value the company as you would regularly value the company. And then you can use the total beta and you can use the higher cost of capital to make that adjustment. But after you come up with the value, you can discount that value for illiquidity. That's what most appraisers do. They knock off 15, 20, 25% of the value for an illiquidity discount. While that might or might not be justifiable, I'd like you to think about an alternative. Rather than drop the value of every private business by 20 or 25%, wouldn't it be more reasonable if that discount were a function of the private business being valued? Small versus large, healthy versus unhealthy, cash flow producing versus non-cash flow producing? We can come up with discounts that vary across businesses, and I think we should. The other way to adjust for illiquidity is to change your discount rate. Add a premium on for illiquidity. And this is different. This is on top of the, the premium you added for the lack of diversification. Here again, you can use some of the techniques we talked about earlier for adjusting the, the discount rate, but please don't do both. If you push up the discount rate for illiquidity and you knock off the value for illiquidity, 
you're counting it twice. So find a place to bring in a liquidity, but do it only once. So that's for private to private businesses, and you can see the issues you have to deal with. The next two scenarios are far simpler. The first is a scenario where you're a private business and you're trying to sell yourself to a public company. Because the potential buyer here has investors who are diversified, it's not the company that has to be diversified, it's its investors. You could argue that in doing this valuation, you should use a conventional valuation. Use the same beta you'd use elsewhere and no illiquidity discount. The problem though, is you're bargaining with a much stronger party. The public company is probably gonna offer you what you think you're worth as a private business and not what you should be worth as a public company. But you should argue back. In fact, your argument will be strengthened if you can find a second bidder in this process. But your valuation should reflect the fact that the potential buyer here is a diversified investor and should not be using an illiquidity discount or a total beta and instead should be using a market beta and valuing your private business as if it were a public company. Good luck to you though in, those, in that bargaining. Let's look at a third scenario. You're a private company and you're the type of private company that can actually go public. You have to do a valuation for an initial public offering, right? In doing that valuation, follow all the rules we followed with public companies. Nothing changes. So you estimate cash flows, come up with the cost of equity and capital based on the market beta, not the total beta. You come up with the value for the company. It is true in an IPO, there are some issues you might, that might be specific to the fact that it's an IPO. A couple of the issues are valuation issues. One is, you got to tell me what you plan to do with the proceeds from the initial public offering. What am I talking about? When you make a public offering and you offer your shares to the public, cash is going to come into the company, right? You got to tell me what you plan to do with the cash, and here are your choices. You can use the cash to invest in new assets, in which case I'm going to add the cash on to my discounted cash flow valuation because that cash is like any other cash balance. You can use the cash to pay down old debt, in which case I'm going to change my debt ratio, redo my cost of capital and revalue the company, but I'm not going to add the cash on to my valuation. Or you can use the cash to take out of the business. So if you're a founder, owner of the business, when you go public, you might use the cash to cash out. If that is the ca case, I can ignore the cash in my valuation. So find out what's going to happen to the proceeds of the valuation. Also dot your I's and cross your T's. In the process of building up to this stage in your, in, in your IPO, you might have given options to other people along the way. To whom? To employees, to venture capitalists. Value those options and take the value of the options out of the value of the equity. There are also a couple of institutional details that will affect evaluation. If you've hired an investment banker to do your IPO and he or she has guaranteed a price to you, it's an underwriting guarantee, the IPO is not going to be at a fair value. It's going to be discounted for an obvious reason. Let's say I've come up with a value of $10 per share for your company. If I offered these shares at $10, I face, face a significant risk as an investment banker from backlash. If I don't sell at the $10, I've got to buy the shares at 10. So I'm going to discount the value, and investment bankers routinely do this on IPOs. And you, as the owner of the company, might go along even though it represents a loss of value to you. Because in most IPOs, not all the shares are offered at the initial public offering. In fact, only five or 10% of the shares might be offered. You might say, so what? Here's why you might accept the underpricing. By underpricing in the initial offering, you might be setting the stage for subsequent offerings a year, two years down the road, where you can offer the remaining shares at a higher price, and you view this as good public relations. So if you have an IPO, factor those into your valuation considerations because it'll affect the price you see on the IPO. Which brings me to the final scenario. What if a venture capitalist approaches you and wants to take a share of your company in return for providing you with capital? A venture capitalist is not quite a diversified investor, so you can't use a market beta, but he or she is likely to be more diversified than a typical independent buyer, so you don't use a total beta. So your cost of equity and capital is going to be somewhere between that of a public company and that of a private business. In fact, here's the interesting follow-up. If you have a small private business that you expect to see transition, first to being owned by venture capitalists and then to going public, and I'm valuing your business, I would expect to see different costs of equity over time. Initially, when you're the owner of the business, given that you're not diversified, I'd be a total beta, end up with a high cost of equity and capital. 
Two or three years down the road, when I see venture capitalists enter the company, I'm going to use a, high, a lower cost of equity and a lower cost of capital, reflecting the fact that those venture capitalists are more diversified than you. And finally, when I get to year five or 10, when you go public, I'm going to switch to a market beta and a market cost of capital. So in summary, valuing private businesses, you follow the same rule book as you do for public companies. You estimate cash flows, correcting for those accounting irregularities we talked about with private businesses. You estimate a discount rate, though that discount rate can be different depending on who the potential buyer is. You value the company, but you might have some mopping up to do, especially if it's a private-to-private -private transaction to reflect the key person and illiquidity.